To truly grasp the enormity of the carbon in our coal exports, consider that the 167.9 million metric tonnes that we export annually generates 453 million tonnes of CO2, which is more than two and a half times the greenhouse pollution generated inside Queensland's borders. Those ships carrying Queensland coal abroad can carry up to 250,000 tonnes of coal. Once burnt, that coal has roughly the same CO2 impact as 160,000 cars do over a year. If we take 80,000 tonnes as the average load on a ship, one leaves a Queensland coal port every four hours. Those trains you see heading towards the port, extending for well over a kilometre, routinely pull 100 wagons of at a time, with each wagon containing 100 tonnes of coal or 270 tonnes of CO2. If we take that, these numbers as an average, over 16,700 trains arrive at our ports every year, 46 a day, one every 32 minutes. Break that down further and Queensland exports over five tonnes of coal a second, 100 tonnes of CO2 every seven seconds, and put another way, we export the average annual emissions of a Queensland household every single second. The pace at which coal exports are growing is equally daunting, with another million tonnes or roughly 15 new shiploads every month. At the rate our coal exports are increasing, Queensland is effectively adding a large new coal-fired power station or steel mill somewhere in the world about every six weeks. This helps to put into proper perspective all the climate smart campaigns and all the talk of doing the bright thing and turning Queensland into a solar state. So for example, if we imagine all the effort involved in 420 solar kindies around the state, installing solar power, the time, the cost, the labour, the paperwork, the young hearts and minds, all inspired. All of that greenhouse pollution cut is added back by just three and a half extra wagons of coal exports. Imagine the excitement, the passion of the kids and staff at over 750 schools across the state, installing solar energy and energy efficient light bulbs, thanks to the Solar Schools Program. How would the kids feel knowing that their CO2 saving is wiped out by less than one train load of coal? Then there's the Solar University of Queensland, the biggest solar rooftop array in the country. The CO2 that will be saved annually will be erased by just six and a half more wagons of coal. As for what is being billed as the largest solar thermal project in the southern hemisphere, which is being tacked onto the existing coal-fired power station at Cogan Creek, that's expected to save enough electricity annually to power 5,000 homes. And that's a saving that's wiped out by four train loads of coal, something that happens roughly every two hours. Let's add in all the other incentives, the solar hot water, solar grants to sports and community associations, the solar Carrara Stadium, even solar panels at Queensland rail stations. If it all adds up to a 500 megawatt virtual solar power station, Doubling Queensland's use of solar energy might save a million tonnes of coal annually. And that sounds pretty good until you realise that we're increasing coal exports by more than a million tonnes every single month. As for the government offsetting its official travel, well, the CO2 saving there is erased by one train load of coal. That's roughly equivalent to pausing the state's coal exports for 37 minutes. Giving out a million energy efficient light bulbs erased by three train loads of coal. Just imagine the effort involved, the bureaucracy involved in distributing a million energy efficient light bulbs. It's the equivalent of pausing our coal ex exports for 90 minutes. As for what it took 74,000 Queenslanders to achieve by signing up to the Bligh government's low carbon diet, the CO2 saved there is packed on by increasing coal exports in just two weeks. The CO2 saved by 260,000 Queenslanders using the Climate Smart Home Service are raised in seven and a half weeks by increasing coal exports. You get the idea. If the government succeeds in cutting the carbon footprint of Queensland householders by one third by 2020, it will save 10.1 million tonnes of CO2 a year. But keep this in mind. Queensland exports that much CO2 in its coal every eight and a half days. And at that rate, at the rate the exports are growing, it takes less than 100 days of new coal exports to erase what it will take Queenslanders a decade to cut their carbon footprint by a third.
Put another way, one new 12 million tonne a year coal mine in central Queensland, which is happening, the Claremont mine, will on its own produce three times as much CO2 as the climate smart householder emission savings by 2020 put together. Now if you get onto Google Earth and you zoom in on a coal stockpile at a Queensland port, depending on how hungry you are, it starts to resemble an enormous block of very dark chocolate. And that's only fitting amidst all the talk about the Bly governments like low carbon diet. Because in a way, coal exports are the government's favourite high carbon treat. And the battle between Anna Bly's big chocolate bar and the low carbon dieting is no contest. For example, during the time it will take me to, to, to deliver this presentation, the plan to cut Queensland's carbon footprint by a third will save 100 tonnes of CO2 or so. Yet over the same 50 to 60 minute period, sorry, it will take that long, another 4,000 tonnes of CO2 will be added just through the increase in coal exports from Queensland. In short, the Bligh government's high carbon diet is about 40 times as effective as its low carbon diet. And to do justice to the sheer brazenness of the claim that the solar state is being climate smart, we need to factor in those export emissions. For those who don't have superhuman eyesight, I've included a little magnifying glass so you can, so you can still see what cutting Queenslanders' carbon footprint by one third by 2020 actually means, that little green bit. Now let's factor in a doubling of uh, coal exports over the next decade as sought by industry and supported by the government. Let's then factor in the 140 million tonnes of CO2 on top of that that would be generated by a 50 million tonne a year LNG export industry, which the government also asp aspires to. Queensland is, sorry, Queensland is then a greenhouse ghetto a decade from now. Between its own emissions and the CO2 exports in its fossil fuels, generating roughly 1.1 billion tonnes of CO2 annually, nearly twice as much as Australia does currently, and not much less than Saudi Arabia exports in its petroleum right now. And just to illustrate that point, here are Saudi Arabia's CO2 exports today compared with ours in 2020. Maybe the billboard on the road in from the airport should read, Welcome to Queensland, Saudi Arabia of the South Pacific. Or perhaps the Premier should just have this number plate attached to her official car. Oh, and uh, in case you're wondering how we can become the Saudi Arabia of the South Pacific when we've also consolidated our position as the solar state by doubling solar energy use? Well, counting solar hot water, which the government does, about 6% of Queenslanders, Queensland's electricity capacity comes from renewable sources, about 1.2% from solar. And because solar is starting from, with touch a, such a tiny share, and because electricity demand in Queensland is set to increase by 55%, doubling our solar energy use has very little impact. By 2020, around 4% of electricity capacity would come from, come from solar and the so-called solar state would remain overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels. Now you have the context required to see the climate smart and solar state branding clearly. While the Queensland public has been busily cutting their carbon footprint, the Bligh government is increasing the state's carbon footprint as if climate change isn't even happening. Once you appreciate this, you won't be surprised to learn that the government is spending more than 13 times as much on infrastructure to expand coal exports as the 1.4 billion it is spending to fight climate change. You won't be surprised to hear that in spite of over 150 climate change impact statements being prepared, not one coal mine or emission intensive project has been prevented from proceeding because of its emissions impact. Nor will you be surprised to learn that the new conditions on new coal-fired power station hailed as a ban on conventional coal-fired power amount to anything but a ban. Ostensibly, they require new coal-fired power stations to capture their emissions or to be carbon re cap capture ready, I should say, and hooked up within five years of the technology becoming commercially viable. Yet the fine print says that the conditions don't apply if the power station is linked to a major project that might go to a developing country where no comparable restriction exists. In practice, there are about 150 such countries. And that very dynamic applies in most new resource projects in Australia. And even if the project being considered for Queensland is not genuinely in competition with an alternative developing country destination, 
Companies are extremely good at pretending otherwise and having helped a major mining company do just that in a previous life to win government support here, I can vouch for that. So even though it sounds nice in practice, sorry, even though it sounds nice in practice, the new conditions on coal-fired power are no significant obstacle to new dirty coal-fired power stations. The great irony is that as most of us are out there doing the bright thing, we're slowly and surely being hooked up to greater coal addiction. In our minds, many of us are already addicts insofar as we accept without question that coal is the economic backbone. A big employer, an indispensable source of tax revenue, our meal ticket in other words. But addiction comes in different forms and our drip, drip is being constantly supplemented. In coal states like Queensland, every time a new coal project proceeds, more people move to coal communities. Those communities become more reliant on coal in turn. And when on the back of a new coal project, people move to town and they build a house, start or refashion their business, their addiction intensifies. When government expands schools and hospitals and other services in those communities, the addiction grows for government. And as families put down roots, send their kids to school and join sporting clubs, make friends, etc., their addiction intensifies. With each of these little steps, the cost of kicking the addiction becomes greater. The current float of the QR National is a great example. It's going to hook up potentially one million retail investors to coal addiction. Their capital gains and their dividend incomes will depend on Queensland continuing to export hundreds of millions of tonnes of coal annually. Punters are in effect being promised a financial rush so long as they back the coal rush. Meanwhile, millions of small businesses in Australia are about to be hooked up to increased coal addiction through the minerals resource rent tax. Of course, it's never put like this by government, but because some of the revenue will be spent cutting the company tax, in effect, a company tax cut for millions of small business depends on continued expansion of coal mining. The same goes for our retirement savings. The aim is that the company tax will enable employers to pay an, increased, an increase in compulsory super contributions. Take away the revenue generated from the new tax, much of which will come from coal mining, and a large share of the, uh, and the drip feed, I should say, is diluted. Sure, you, you do hear the coal mining industry complain about some of these things, but they also know that each of these steps makes it harder for coal addicted governments to kick the habit. And each little step helps to lock in permanency for the industry. Most of us don't even notice the needle going in or the dose being raised. Others bank on a miracle cure for our coal addiction, clean coal technology.